uh, Miguel, while, while people are still coming in, let me just uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, this. I don't know. I, I noticed that, uh, I, I mean, I sent you the link uh, of Indira's talk. Indira did, did this talk about mixed methods, right, about uh, two weeks ago. Um, and before that, what we've been trying to do here is to get these guys ready to write their paper for AMSIS 2023. Uh, many of the researchers in Latin America find it difficult to go to the conferences when they are in the US because that requires a visa. Uh, and many times people have to do a, almost like an international trip just to get the visa before they, they can uh, go abroad. But considering that next year we'll have this conference in Panama, uh, we believe that we can uh, draw a larger crowd of uh, Latin Americans to it. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll have many of these guys that will be uh, watching our presentations here today, uh, sending their papers to that conference. And by the way, what we will do is still during, during our research seminars this year, uh, we will have them review papers of their colleagues or the ideas that their, their, their colleagues have already put on paper uh, as if they were reviewers, because we do believe that many times we learn more uh, how to write well better papers when we're reviewing other people's uh, work than when we are trying to review our own work, right? It seems that it's easier to, to figure out what others are doing wrong than what we are doing wrong. So we're going to be exchanging papers uh, among the, the students here, and they will work as if they were reviewers using the, you know, the, the same same uh, templates or the same um, for, uh, forms that we as reviewers have to use to uh, to say if a paper was a good paper or not. and, and uh, we, we do believe that that will also help them improve the quality of their their own uh, their own work. Uh, I, I, I will do some more formal uh, introduction of uh, Professor uh, Miguel Aguirre here in a second, but uh, while well, he's obviously also a uh, Latin American, he had he has this problem about his bio that he's one of those guys who thinks that Maradona is a better was a better player than Pelé. You know, can you figure that out? Can you understand that? <laughs> that already gives uh, an idea. Uh, where obviously where I am from and where he is from. <laughs> and uh, well, and now Miguel will have Donna with us. I was I was talking about um, Donna before. Donna is uh, 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 she she is in in Panama. Uh, she's a, a professor there at uh, uh, one of their universities, and she's she's been an enthusiastic of our research seminars and has uh, many of uh, the the students that have been attending this regularly are. Our Panamanians, who we hope will write their first uh, academic paper directly to our AMSIS in, in Panama. So, Donna, uh, I, I was just uh, uh, telling uh, uh, telling Miguel about you. So, if you just show, if, I don't know if you have your, uh, if you can open your camera, Donna, but it's it's a good time of doing some virtual presentations here. And and, and Donna is also going to be uh, part of the LACAIS team. Hi, Donna. Uh, who will be uh, organizing the mini tracks of the Portuguese and, and Spanish, of course, she's in the, the Spanish side of the thing for AMSIS uh, next year. Um, well, guys, I, I do believe that we we, we can uh, start this slowly. Uh, many more people will be joining us uh, in the in the next uh, few minutes, I, I hope. But uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, Professor Miguel Aguirre. Uh, as I, I was telling you, he uh, well, he's, he's a, a Latin American, as as all of us. Uh, he teaches at uh, the Florida International University, uh, and uh, I can say that he's probably one of the uh, most regular uh, Latin Americans in the in the uh, Association of Information Systems conferences uh, over time. Uh, so uh, I appreciate his time here with us, uh, telling us a little bit about uh, the, the use of quantitative uh, methods to to I mean to to, to write uh, academic uh, papers. Uh, I have uh, included here very, and I'll try to show it very quickly uh, to you. The the, the 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 presentation to the, today will be, and and, and the title was uh, my uh, my own uh, uh, decision here. Uh, uh, Miguel had sent me an abstract for his presentation, but I just summarized that as an overview of quantitative methods that are, are available for information systems uh, research. Uh, Miguel has sent us uh, a few reference uh, papers uh, that I have already included here in our in our Moodle, so you can check. And, and by the way, he sent uh, this uh, draft of a, a typical structure of a quantitative research study. And uh, for those of you who have already had a chance of uh, having a look at it, you will see that there is a huge resemblance to, you know, Miguel, we, we were talking here about a template for an academic paper, uh, which has a structure that is very close to the one that you show in your typical structure of a quantitative, a quantitative research studies, which means that you will 
definitely not be in any disagreement with things that have been said in the seminars before. And then he also sent some uh, some papers by Merthers and uh, Recker, 2020, and Straub, Geffen, and uh, Boudreau, uh, 2004, to support uh, some of the, the ideas that he will be discussing with us. There's also uh, here a website. Uh, well, uh, Recker is one of the the, the authors of this uh, this paper here, uh, and and there's a, an interesting quantitative quantitative research uh, website that he has included there for us. And of course, after we finish today uh, his presentation, not immediately because we do, we need to do some editing, but uh, uh, we will have his talk uh, also included here in our Lacai's tube uh, um, uh, uh, series of uh, research seminars. So having said that, uh, uh, I'd like to again thank uh, uh, Miguel very much for for being here with us uh, today. Uh, and and for his uh, uh, you know the, his talk on quantitative quantitative methods, we we had the qualitative methods and mixed methods last couple of weeks ago. Now we'll get into quantitative, uh, which is uh, probably the 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 kind of uh, work that's still uh, I'd say Miguel Miguel can uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it's still probably the mainstream in information systems. We still have many more papers that are quantitative than qualitative in our in, in not only in in our conferences but also in in our journals. So. Uh, pay attention to what he has to tell us because it's gold in preparing good research papers. Thank you very much again, uh, Miguel, and, and the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to, to, to this talk on, on quantitative research methods. Uh, uh, when Alex and I were talking about this for the past couple of weeks, I purposely wanted to stay away from any math uh, because otherwise people, people start to fall asleep very, very fast. Uh, but if you are a quantitative researcher, uh, statistics are, are just part of who you are. Uh, so so um, I don't I don't think I have any math in here. Uh, but if, if you have any questions about anything that I'm talking about or, or uh, down, down the road after the presentation is over, if you want to connect and have questions about specifics and details, I'm more than happy, uh, more than happy to, to talk to you about anything. Um, I don't know, Alex, how you usually run this. I'm, I'm fine if people want to stop me as I'm talking or whatever works for you best. Yeah, I, I think just uh, you're just Start, start going, and if people okay. have questions, and, okay. and if, you're, if you're glad that they just uh, interrupt you, they can just open their mics. Uh, usually, you, you, you will talk, and then at the end, we'll have uh, uh, time for, 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 for questions. But feel free, people, if, if, if Miguel is giving us this opportunity, feel free. Yeah. If you don't understand something or if you want to uh, say anything, just jump in. Okay, Thank you, Miguel. Sure, absolutely. So feel, feel free to stop me at any time if, if there's something that, that catches your attention or something, I'd be happy to, to stop. Mm -hmm. So um, let me give you a, a quick See if I can make this work. There we go. Uh, just a bit of background myself, uh, and a couple of things. Uh, I'm originally, as, as Alex hinted at, I'm originally from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. Uh, I'm a public accountant by training. I used to be an auditor. I used to work for, for, accounting, in account, for accounting companies and in accounting functions. After a few years of being an accountant, I decided that I have done as much accounting as I ever wanted to do. Uh, so um, about 20, well, in 2022, so 22 years ago, 21, uh, 20 years ago, uh, my wife and I came over for me uh, to do my MBA at Indiana, and, and we stayed. Uh, so um, my MBA is Information Systems, Finance and Strategy from IU. Uh, I work for a bit at a company called Brandon Williamson Tobacco in Louisville. Uh, if, if you're a smoker, Lucky Strike, Virginia Slims, Paul Mall, that kind of thing. Um, then I decided that I really didn't want to go back to, to a corporate setting. Uh, I went to University of Kansas to get my, my PhD there. Uh, and there I started having uh, an interest in, in research methods. I'm a quantitative researcher by training fully. I have never had a qualitative research class ever in my life. I appreciate qualitative research. Well done qualitative research is, is extremely interesting, uh, but I'm not that person. I'm just not trained that way. Um, and at KU, which was completely a, a quantitative uh, shop, um, I started to have an interest in, in research methods as, as a subject of study. So I do quite a bit of my research on research methods uh, themselves. Uh, so, so uh, and I'll talk a bit, bit more about it uh, today. Um, I've been a professor since uh, 2008. I was at the uh, DePaul University in Chicago for about six years, uh, Texas Tech University four years, and I've been at FIU uh, since 2018. Um, I always done graduate level teaching. Uh, the last few years, I only do doctoral level teaching. And as of a month and a half ago, two months ago, I'm the director of doctoral programs for FIU business. So I, I oversee both PhD programs and our doctorate in business administration programs. So for anybody who is a master's student who has already done or will do their GMAT or GRE soon, 
and who's interested in maybe getting a PhD here, by all means, uh, please feel free, to, feel free to reach out, and I'll be happy to, to put you in touch with, with, our, with our folks. All right, so let me tell you a bit about what I want to talk about today. So I'll start by, by going over you know, what quantitative methods are and why uh, we, we, we do quantitative methods, at least why I, I find them interesting. Um, this is also somewhat of a why do we do statistics, since you can't really do quantitative methods without statistics. Uh, if statistics are not your thing, then quantitative research is not going to be your thing. Um, there's a, quite a bit of work in statistics that we need to do to do well done quantitative methods. Uh, then I'll talk uh, somewhat about the importance of measurement. I'm a big believer that measurement and good quality, well done measurement is one of the key things that we can do to make our quantitative studies uh, really well done. And I'll explain why, why I think that. Um, then I go over what I think are probably the, the three most common quantitative designs that you're going to come across in IS research, uh, experiments, surveys, and much less often uh, meta-analysis. Uh, I do agree with Alex was talking earlier. Uh, I do think quantitative uh, research studies are still most likely the, the vast majority, well, the majority at least, of, of uh, papers in our discipline. Uh, I'll speak a bit about uh, statistical testing, which is the cornerstone of quantitative research methods, and the five key things or five key elements that sh you should always be looking for when you do statistical testing, and you should always be reporting when you do statistical testing. And this is all a very, very high level conceptual discussion, so there's no math whatsoever. But if you're interested in the math, by all means, please, please do let me know. Uh, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with a, a few uh, key, key takeaways. Uh, before we get started, I should mention, uh, I've, been, I've been coming to AMSIS with, with a couple of exceptions due to moving from one university to another for the better part of, of 15 years. I am also the track chair for the human computer interaction track, and I've been doing that for 10 years. 12 years, something like that. Uh, so I've been around in AMSIS uh, for quite quite a few years. I'm always very happy when, when we take AMSIS uh, out, of, out of the US and Canada. Uh, for one, the food is much better, always, when you go out. Uh, but also, I think it's a great opportunity to, to, to provide opportunities for other people to come and visit and, and enjoy. So uh, I'm very much looking forward. I will be there in, in Panama next, next year. All right, so let me go ahead and get started. So um, why statistics or why quantitative uh, research methods? Uh, and, and again, if you're, if you're a quantitative research method or a quantitative researcher, statistics are your main source of evidence. Uh, this is how we show other researchers, our readers, reviewers, that we have evidence supporting whatever claims or statements we're making when we, when we do our, our research. Um, now, I'm very, very convinced that statistics and quantitative methods are really a means to an end. Unless you're somebody like me who enjoys doing research on research methods themselves, uh, if you are a quantitative researcher, uh, statistics and research methods are the tools that you use to provide evidence that the claims you're making in your studies uh, are, are sound and there's a basis for making those claims and that you have done all the necessary work to provide evidence for, for those claims. Uh, so so I, very much throughout, throughout this presentation, uh, keep that in mind as, as, as we go along. And the, the real reason why we do all of this is so that we can provide evidence uh, that we have support for the claims that we're making. So, so I see quantitative methods and statistics really about you know, collecting and, and analyzing data. Um, I think that uh, statistics and quantitative methods show up or should, should show up uh, in three different stages of, of your research. I'm going to make a big point out of this here. Um, how you plan on collecting data, how you plan on cleaning up your data, how you plan on analyzing your data uh, should be a major thing you should be thinking about when you're designing a future, a future study. Up until the point you start collecting data, you can always go back and change your design. You can always go back and add a few more questions to a survey or add a manipulation check to an experiment. I'll talk more about those uh, today. But the moment you start collecting data, everything is set in stone. There's nothing you can do to fix a poor design. If you do an experiment without taking into account what you should take into account, then there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, doesn't matter how much data you collected. Doesn't matter how advanced your statistics are. It, it, nothing really matters. If it's poorly designed, if a quantitative study is poorly designed, there's nothing we can do about it. So uh, I do encourage anybody who wants to do quantitative research studies 
to spend a fair amount of time before actually doing the research, to spend a fair amount of time making sure that what you're planning on doing and thinking of doing uh, is actually sound, because there's nothing we can do afterwards, uh, short, of course, of redoing the study, which, of course, you don't want to do. So um, statistics and quantitative methods, how you plan on collecting your data, how you plan on analyzing your data, which techniques are you going to use, which tests are you going to run, all of that should factor into your design, because there's nothing you can do about it afterwards, uh, short of redoing this. So uh, the first place where, where quantitative methods and statistics should come into your thinking is before you do any statistics and before you do any data collection or surveys or experiments. It's at the time when you're designing, designing the research. Then once you have uh, gone out and collected some data or run an experiment, uh, the next place where statistics uh, shows up is in allowing you to summarize the data you obtained from the study. Now, of course, there's a lot more that happens here. There's you know, data cleaning that needs to happen. There's uh, possibly outliers that need to be identified or maybe removed. There's quite a bit of, of behind the scenes work. But the next step after you collect data is to summarize it and, and show and, and write to your, to your readers and reviewers and editors, uh, this is what I found. This is how much data I collected. This is where it comes from. This is what the people who participated in my study look like. Uh, these are the relationships that I found, whether it is an experiment or a survey or something else. Uh, this is what I found from this sample of data that I went out and collected. Now, that is going to be uh, the main part of your writing when you're doing a quantitative research study, is, is showing how you collected data, showing what you did to collect data you know, properly and uh, with all the safeguards that we need to do, and then uh, telling me what you found when you went out and, and collected this data. But really, the most interesting part of this, and this is why you're doing the research, uh, is the, the last the last stage here. We do not collect data because we want to know what this specific group of people who participate in our survey or this specific group of people who participate in our, in our experiment. Um, we, don't, we don't do it because we want to know what they think. We want, of course, we care about them and their nice people and they, were, uh, they participate in our studies. But what we're try, really trying to do here is say, based on this data that I collected about this group of people who answered my survey or participated in my experiment, what can I say about everybody else out there that I'm interested in, but who did not participate in my survey or in my experiment? What kind of inferences can I make about the wider population of people out there who, who, um, who I don't know about because I don't have data about them, but based on the data that I do have, I want to be able to say something about the wider population. That's really what we're interested in doing with, with, quantitative, with quantitative research. Uh, we're trying to get some amount of data from a group of people, a sample of people, or it could be companies, if you're studying that, uh, a sample of, of people from a population that we're interested in. And based on the data we collected, we want to be able to say something about all the other people out there who did not participate in my study. And that is really the ultimate goal. Of, of doing quantitative research. How can I go from this group of people who answer my survey or my experiment to the wider population out there that I did not get to see, but they're really what I'm interested in in study. So statistics is, uh, if you're a quantitative researcher, statistics is your main source of, of evidence. This is how we show everybody else, our colleagues, reviewers, readers, editors, these are, this is the evidence that I have to support the claims I'm going to tell you. This is how I feel comfortable telling you there's a relationship between this and this. So if you want more of this, then you should do more of that. This is how uh, we show that, um, we show the evidence for that. I believe a statistics should be thought about in terms of, of model building. I don't think we typically teach it this way, uh, but I think we probably should. Um, when we do quantitative research, uh, really what we're trying to do, I think, is we have one or more outcomes of interest that we would like to understand and explain and maybe predict in the future. Um, this could be, you know, this is anything that you're studying. You might be interested in knowing, for instance, why is it that some people are happier than others? Why is it that some people have a stronger or weaker attitudes towards something? Uh, why is it that some people are more or less likely to try out new technologies in the future? So we always have one or more outcomes that we're interested in understanding, explaining, maybe down the road, predicting. Now, for those outcomes to be interesting, 
uh, there has to be some variability in them. Uh, if you're a quantitative researcher, you thrive on variability. If I want to understand uh, why some people are happier than others, then some people have to be happier than others. If everybody's equally happy, or if everybody has the same attitude, or if everybody's going to vote for the same candidate in an election, then there's really nothing to study. Uh, the moment somebody has you know, more or less positive attitude or weaker, stronger perceptions of something, or some people are happier than others, then there is something worth, worth studying. So we have one or more outcomes. Uh, this is what we're really trying to understand. Why is it that uh, we have some people or some companies, why some companies are more profitable than others? That's an interesting outcome. In part, it will have something to do with, with information systems and, and technology. So we have one or more outcomes that we're interested in. And, and really what we do as researchers is to postulate some models uh, that we think explain why those outcomes take on different values for different people. So if you are trying to understand you know, why are some people happier than others, then you could say, you know, based on my, my thinking and my reading and my theory and my research, uh, I postulate that there are three reasons why some people are happier than others. Some people make more money than others. So maybe money has something to do with that. Uh, some people have a different family structure. Maybe that has something to do with that. Um, some people have a more or less fulfilling uh, job, and maybe that has something to do with that. So just like we need variability in the outcomes, because otherwise there's nothing to study, we also need variability in, in the model, in the reasons, in the factors that we think are the reasons why there's variability in the outcome. So uh, I, I, do, I do strongly believe that, that we should be teaching quantitative research and statistics this way. Uh, there's one or more outcomes that you're interested in. Our job is to figure out the reasons why uh, those outcomes take on different values for different people. And we do that by means of building models that we think explain uh, what those outcomes are. Anything that our models do not capture, do not explain, uh, we're going to call that error. And, and hopefully down the road, somebody else will come around, or maybe ourselves in the future, will come around and say, I think these researchers were missing something. I have a, a fourth reason why I believe some people are happier than others, and it has to do with this. And over time, uh, we, should, uh, we should strive to build increasingly better models that explain increasingly more of, of those outcomes. And that's how research moves, moves forward. Uh, if you look at maybe what is probably one of the most well-studied streams of work in IS, which is the technology acceptance work, uh, over years and years and years of research, we have quite more complex models that we started with, but also explain a lot more of the outcome that we started with. Now, those models take on different values. Some of them have you know, categorical variables, some of them have a regression models, others are experiment, but the overall idea that what we're really trying to do here is to come up with a model that explains why outcomes that we are interested in happen, I think applies to, to all of those. So this is a, a very stylized, or of course it's not really true because it's a lot more messy than, than how we actually do research, but this is an, an overall sequence of, of the quantitative research process. And, and if, you, uh, if you follow the steps, um, you will end up with something very similar to that, that structure of quantitative research studies that we have already, that we have already seen. Uh, my end of the world happens on this portion of this process. This is where I, I do my work. Uh, but overall, if you, if you think about what a quantitative research paper looks like, we always have some kind of, of introduction where we, where we uh, talk about the problem we're interested in addressing, where we try to convince people that this is an interesting problem to be looking into, uh, where we tell our readers why we think we should be spending time on this problem, and we typically close with some kind of, of research question. Uh, after that, we have a section, which is our, our literature review, where we go over um, any other kinds of, of theories and past research and so on that we think help inform uh, the, the research questions that we're interested in. After that, we're going to have uh, some section where we propose a research model uh, and we write some hypotheses and we make some, some predictions as to what we think is going on uh, behind those, those outcomes that we're interested in. And then we go out and collect some data. We have a, a methods chapter, or methods, uh, not a chapter for dissertation, methods section, where we talk about which data and how we collected it and so on. 
and then we get to our we get to our results. So of course this process doesn't quite work in these nice very sequential stages. There's a lot of, of feedback loops and coming and going that happen. But when you read about it in the way we write it up and the way we report it, uh, we like to have this very uh, nice you know sequence of steps that that makes it look like we always uh, we always thought about it this way. So uh, the the stuff that I'm talking about today and this is where I do my own my own research work happens uh, happens down down here. Uh, in that, you know, from from the I have a research model stage to this is the data that I collected. This is the survey that I've done. Uh, this is maybe the experiment that I that I conducted. Uh, let me tell you about what I found, and, and and let me show you how well I did it. So you're convinced that what I found is is actually there. And I'm a big big um, believer that that the quality of the methods that we use really drives the quality of the results we get. And that's why with, with our students, we spend a lot of time emphasizing the idea that if you have a poorly designed study, there's nothing worth doing there because I don't know what you're going to find, but I will not believe it uh, because it is it is poorly designed. So uh, with that in mind, let me transition to, to measurement. Uh, again, I'm a big, big believer that the quality of measurement may be, I think, the single most important thing you can do uh, to make sure that that your uh, results are you know, reliable, believable, trustworthy, and, and then you will, will convince me or our reviewers or your readers that you actually have evidence for, for what you're trying to do. Uh, think about uh, the example I often use when I start talking about measurement. Think about trying to measure uh, your weight. Uh, I could ask somebody to look at me uh, and give an estimate of how much I weigh. Uh, and that will typically not be a terribly accurate estimate. Uh, if I wanted a better estimate, I could uh, put myself on a scale and I would get a number. Uh, but I don't know from a single measure, I do not know how accurate that scale is. Uh, so I get myself on a second scale, and maybe on a third scale. And at some point, if I kept getting similar results from multiple scales, that must be what my weight is uh, with different levels of precision, unless those scales are very wrong. But let's assume that's, that's not the case. So measurement establishes that connection between the, the theory portion of your work and the uh, real world where you go out and collect your data from. When you're working on the theory portion of your work, uh, you're talking about concepts, you're talking about constructs, you're working in very theoretical, you know, conceptual terms. You're saying, I think that the reason why uh, people are going to uh, perform better or worse when using this technology has to do with these three things. I think it has to do with uh, computer self-efficacy, and I think it has to do with the motivation, and I think it has to do with this and this and this. Those are all concepts. And when we're working at the theory level, we deal with, with concepts, and, um, you know, which are, again, abstract. And that's how, we, that's how we do theory development. Now, when I want to go from, <clears throat> when I want to go from my concepts in my theories and my research models, to the actual real world where I go out and collect data to see if I'm if I'm right about what I'm thinking about. Uh, then I need to go through through a set of, of measures. I need to find a way for me to measure, you know, let's say computer self-efficacy or perceptions of usefulness or whatever it is you're studying. I need to find a way to measure that so I can say something like, as your computer self-efficacy goes up, your performance will go up as a result. For me to be able to do that, I need to have a way of measuring computer self-efficacy, and I need to have a way of measuring performance. So measurement really brings together your theory and how you think about these relationships and effects and so on, and the real world where these things are happening from which you're trying to get your data. So the relationship between theory and measure has to do with, with shared meaning. Uh, is this is that is this set of questions that I'm writing in a survey? Is this a good measure of what I'm thinking about in terms of this construct, whether it's a perception, an attitude, or something else? Uh, and that's one thing we're going to spend quite a bit of time working on as quantitative researchers. The other connection between your measure and the real world where you go out and collect your data has to do with making sure those measures are accurate. They're they're accurate in capturing the data from the real world that you can use to, to test your, your relationships. So I truly, truly believe 
that uh, high quality or good quality measurement may be the single most important thing you can do to ensure that you have good quality results. Uh, if you cannot show me that you have successfully measured the variables or constructs in your research model, then I'm not sure I can believe uh, whatever results, whatever results you're telling me. So when it comes to measurement, uh, the concern that we have is I'm asking people to answer, uh, let's say I'm doing a survey, I'm asking people to answer a series of questions. Uh, how can I justify that the questions you are answering in my survey or in my experiment uh, are really good measures of what I think I'm measuring? So there's a few things that we do to ensure that is that is actually the case. And again, I'm staying here away from, from the, the math and the stats behind this. Um, but anybody who's interested, I'll be happy to talk more about them or, or continue offline um, if, if, if you want to. So um, things that we do to ensure that our measures are, are good measures of, of our constructs. Uh, we spend time working on, on content validity. Uh, I should be able, as a, as a reader of your work or anybody's work, I should be able to look at the definition of a construct that you have in your research model. I should be able to look at the questions you use to measure that construct, and I should be able to see a clear connection between the two. I should be able to read your questions and say, yes, this sounds like, this is what I was thinking when I was reading your construct. This, this clearly is, is something in line with what you're trying to measure. Something else I should be able to do, I should be able to see that the set of questions that you're using to measure something only measure that something and not something else. Uh, if you are telling me that these sort of questions are a good measure for attitude towards, say, new technology, then for that to be the case, they can also not be measuring some other perception or some other intention or something else. Uh, if, if they do, then there's, there's noise there. Uh, if, if a question is measuring two things at once, then when somebody answers that question, how do I know what they're answering about? Uh, I need my questions to be, you know, a good question is one that measures one thing and only one thing at a time. So to do that, we look at a couple of things. Uh, we look at the screen and validity, <clears throat> which allows me to say, this set of questions are a measure of this, but this other set of questions are a measure of something else. And I can show that's actually the case. And I will also look at conversion validity, which means if I have questions that I'm saying or arguing are both measures of the same thing, then I would expect them to behave in a certain way. Uh, going back to my example on, on scales for weighting myself, if I'm arguing that multiple scales are all weighting, uh, measuring my weight, then I should be getting very similar results from all of them. Uh, if I get very different results, then they cannot be all measuring my weight. So uh, a good set of questions, a good measure of anything is one where we can clearly see how it connects with the definition of, of the construct you're measuring. It's one that measures one and only one thing at a time, and it doesn't measure other different things. And finally, a good measure of a construct should behave in a way that is consistent with the theory and what we know about that construct. Uh, for example, I did a lot of my, my own work on computer self-efficacy. We know, based on decades of theory and research, that computer self-efficacy should have a positive relationship with performance. And so if you show me a new measure of computer self-efficacy that you have developed, which does not have a positive relationship with performance, uh, one of two things are happening. Either you, our theory, our decades of theory is, is wrong or incomplete. There's some ways, some places where self-efficacy and performance are not related, or you're not really measuring self-efficacy because it doesn't behave the way we would expect it. So uh, we will look at content validity, we look at construct validity, and we look at uh, nomological validity, where a measure behaves the way we expect it to, based on the theory that we have. The other thing that is important for the quality of measurement is, is reliability. Uh, we would like to know the extent to which a set of questions that we say are measuring something uh, actually are consistent with one another if, if, uh, if I use them multiple times. Uh, going back to my to my scale example, if I get on a scale and it says I weigh 90 kilos, and then I get on it again, it should say I weigh 90 kilos, give and take some margin of error. Uh, and, and, and it should behave that way every single time, unless my weight has changed drastically. 
So uh, now if I get on a scale and it says 90 and I get on it tomorrow and it says 70, it's very unlikely that I lost 20 kilos in a day. There's something wrong with the scale. So uh, there's a number of different ways in which we can establish the reliability of our measures. Uh, they depend on the type of measures you're using. Uh, that depends on the type of, of research designs that we're using. The most common one, uh, internal consistency, if you're familiar with, with Cronbach Alpha and stuff like that. Uh, if I have a set of questions that I think are a good measure of something, then I would expect the answers to those questions to behave consistently with one another. Uh, and, and if that's the case, then at least it looks like they are all measuring the same thing. But in our designs, uh, we fall back on, for instance, inter-rater reliability. If you ever watched a gymnastics competition in the Olympic Games, then you will know that you are or diving, for instance, you will see people doing their flips and flops and so on. And then three or more judges will have a sign with, with the, the grading for that, for the competition. If they're all grading the same performance using the same standards for that performance, then I would expect to see very similar grades. Uh, if that's not the case, there's some problem with, with our measurement. Uh, and if you, you know, if you watch enough, you know, uh, competitions, you will see that the grades are always the, the scores from the judges are always very, very close. Uh, boxing behaves the, the same way. Uh, there are other ways, of course, I could, for instance, uh, give you half of a measure and then the other half and see if any two halves work well together. I could measure you multiple times, say last week and this week and see if I get similar results. All of this boils down to, to, uh, boils down to allow me to see that, that a set of questions, a set of measures behaves the way I would expect them to. So taken together, if I can establish the validity of my measures and I can establish the reliability of my measures, then myself as a reader or reviewer or editor of your work, I'm going to be more inclined to believe uh, whatever results you, you are presenting because I know at least the way you're measuring your constructs is, is sound. I'm not going to go into, into a lot of detail on this. I just wanted you to, to see how much work it is to, to develop sound, well-designed measures of our constructs. Uh, this is from, from Jan Recker's uh, work, a 2021 paper, very interesting 2021 paper, uh, just to show you the amount of work that is involved in doing this. Uh, part of the reason why I'm showing you this, and this is a bit of a personal view, um, you will come across folks in our, in our discipline who will tell you that uh, developing new measures for constructs is just, you know, it's, it's not really publishable. I strongly disagree with that. I think that a well-designed, well-developed measurement developing process is central to our research, and it should be seen as a major research project on its own. Uh, just because of the amount of work that happens for us to have really high quality good measures. So uh, this whole process, and again, we'll not spend time on, on the details, uh, this whole process begins with us having uh, well thought out theories and domains and definitions of our constructs and ends with us having uh, a set of items that we can then use in a research study to collect data about whatever we're interested in. And I just wanted to highlight the tremendous amount of work that doing this properly uh, takes on. So the first part of, of the uh, presentation today, I talk a bit about statistics and why, why they are so important. These are main source of evidence. Then I talked about uh, quality of measurement. And I'm a big, big believer that high quality measurement is essential to the quality of quantitative research. Uh, if you cannot convince me that you have measured your constructs properly, then I'm very unlikely to believe uh, whatever results you're presenting to me later about those constructs that I'm not convinced you have measured properly. So with that in mind, let me switch to what I think are the three most common types of research designs in information systems and some of the key issues. In addition to the quality of measurement, quality of measurement applies to, to everything we're doing here. But in addition to those, depending on the research design you're using, there are some specific things you need to be, to be mindful of. So uh, for each one of these, I have an example from a published study and I can walk you through, through some of those details. So one of the most common uh, types of research designs in IS is an experiment or, or was an experiment maybe. Uh, in an experiment, we assign uh, participants, people, to different conditions and then we expose them to different stimuli. Uh, maybe we have them uh, see a video, maybe we have them read a paragraph. 
<clears throat> maybe we have them undergo a training exercise. The idea being by exposing different groups of people to different stimuli, I can manipulate them in a way that allows me to show uh, certain effects. I can say by showing them this video where I presented them with these ideas, I was able to manipulate or influence the way my participants perceive the technology or think about it or their perceptions of it and so on. Um, experiments, pure traditional pure experiments are those where we randomly assign people to different groups or conditions. And that random assignment has, has a tremendous power uh, in an experimental design. Sometimes that is not feasible, it's not possible. Uh, so we will do what we call quasi experiments where we do have different groups of people being exposed to different stimuli, but they have not been randomly assigned to different, to different groups. If you are doing experimental research, uh, there's a couple of quick uh, key issues that you need to keep in mind. The first one uh, has to do with internal validity. And internal validity has to do with, in general, has to do with me as a researcher being able to establish that the reason for the effects that I'm observing in my research is, is what I have done in my research and not something else. Uh, in experiments, randomly assigning people to different conditions is the key mechanism that allows me to establish internal validity. Uh, think about what would happen if that were not the case. For example, if I were to allow people in an experiment to self-select themselves into different, into different groups. Let's say I'm doing an experiment where I'm recruiting a sample of, of undergraduate students uh, to do something. And instead of randomly assigning them to different conditions, I tell them uh, there's going to be two time slots for, for you to participate in this experiment. Uh, you can sign up for the early Monday morning slot, or you can sign up for the late Wednesday afternoon slot. And therefore, a risk uh, or a concern there is, are people who sign up for the early Monday morning slot somewhat different in some way from the people who sign up to the late afternoon on Wednesday? Uh, maybe morning people are different than, than afternoon people. Because I didn't randomly assign the, the students to the, to the conditions, when later I come out and claim uh, the people who participated in this manipulation had different results than in that manipulation, a counter argument is, well, maybe the people Monday morning were already different than the people on Wednesday afternoon. How, how can you account for that? And the answer is you can. Now, if you randomly assign people to conditions, then it doesn't really matter because the likelihood that all one kind of people will end up all together in the same condition is really, really small. The other thing to think about if you're doing experiments uh, is something called manipulation checks. Uh, I want to be able to show to my readers and reviewers and so on that when I did an experiment and I assigned uh, groups of people to different conditions and I exposed them to different stimuli, whatever I, I did to them, I want to show that they actually you know, notice what I was doing uh, so that I can argue uh, any results that I get in this experiment are a result of that manipulation. Uh, if you do not include manipulation checks in your experiments, then I don't really know whether the results you're getting are because of your theory and research design or because of something else. Uh, and, and this is another example of once you start collecting data, anything that you didn't think about and you didn't put in your research, there's nothing we can do about it afterwards. So a lot of time should go into, into planning um, research studies. Uh, one of the challenges or downsides of experiments, we can get, they can get very complex very, very quickly. Uh, let's say, for instance, that you want to study uh, different ways of training people. So you might say, well, I have three different ways of, of training people. And then I want to uh, also consider, well, I should say training. Uh, I also want to consider whether, let's say, I have two different professions. Maybe that makes a difference. And before you know it, you have, say, another two groups of something. Uh, all of a sudden, you have 12 different combinations of 12 different combinations of, of groups of people. Uh, these things get, get very complicated very fast. But for really well-defined specific things, specific conditions, experiments work really well. Let me show you an example one. Uh, this is an ISR paper, I believe. Uh, this is my dissertation advisor's dissertation. Uh, what he was interested in is an experiment, or some of an experiment. Uh, what he was interested in was on systems analysis, development of, of, new, of new technologies. And the concern is that stage when we are capturing requirements 
so that we can develop software, uh, we know is, is fraught with a lot of, of issues. So the concern was, can I train systems analysts to ask better questions so that they can get more answers out of users and presumably that will allow them to build better software as a result. So the goal of the dissertation was to try a semantic structuring training program to train systems analysts to ask better questions and get better information out of, out of the uh, users. So the experimental design in that paper was a relatively simple two by two design. Uh, the authors here recruited two different groups of people to participate. <clears throat> Some of them, the, the low experienced people were, were students in, in MIS and the high experienced people were already syst working systems analysts who had at least, I think, five years of experience uh, doing this work. The experimental manipulation was one group of people was trained in this specific way of asking questions, uh, whereas the other group of people were not trained in this specific way of asking questions. And the issue there is you know, how much better are they at asking questions and eliciting requirements and so on if they have been trained with this approach than if they haven't. Uh, because people were randomly assigned to one condition or the other, um, these groups are otherwise comparable. With one caveat, because the uh, low experience, high experience condition, uh, students and professionals, was not something you can randomly assign. People are already students or are already professionals. Uh, you have to keep in mind that that might be uh, another reason why we see these effects. Uh, maybe there's a reason why some people are professionals with five years of work experience in, in uh, systems analysis and design, and some people are students who may never become systems analysts. Uh, the other thing to look for, so this is a, this is a concern here. Uh, the other thing to look for is how do I know that the people who participated in the training paid enough attention to the training program so that I can argue it is the training that resulted in them asking better questions than if they had not been trained. So for that, I need some manipulation checks. I need to have some questions in that experiment to ensure me that the way I manipulated the people, the participants in the experiment, actually had an impact on them so that I can claim by training these folks in this manner, I was able to improve the way, improve their performance. I was able to improve their performance when it comes to asking questions and designing better systems in the future. So in an experimental design, which is one of, of, of the most common uh, designs in, in IS research, we uh, are interested in understanding a really specific type of question, otherwise it gets very complicated very fast. Um, and we do this by randomly assigning people to groups, uh, exposing them to different stimuli, and see if that makes a difference. And if it does, then I have a very solid basis to argue by training, in this example, by training these analysts with this approach, uh, they end up doing better than the very similar group of analysts who are not trained with this approach in terms of their performance. A very powerful design uh, in terms of allowing me to make that kind of, of statement. Of course, this assumes that you are able to successfully measure performance with all those validities and reliabilities and so on that I talked about before. Second, and this is, I think, by far the most common uh, type of research design in IS is surveys. Uh, in surveys, unlike experiments, uh, we do not uh, randomly assign people to groups or anything like that. In surveys, we seek to go out and measure uh, in, in, you know, in the natural state, I guess, uh, and to measure different variables that we think have an impact on some outcome that we're interested in. So the traditional way you're going to see a survey in a paper is by having these, these boxes and arrows models where you have, say, three different factors affecting something and that in turn affects something else and so on, that is going to be most likely some form of survey. Uh, in an experiment, we, we establish internal validity by saying, well, I randomly assign people to conditions. Therefore, the only reason, the only way in which they are different is these people were trained and these people were not. And if the ones who are trained do better than the ones who are not trained, <clears throat> that means the training actually works because otherwise they are comparable. In a survey, because we don't have that, we establish internal validity in, in a few different ways. Uh, we need to be able to argue 
that the let's say the independent variables here happen temporally before the the dependent variables otherwise if something doesn't happen before something else then the first something cannot be a cause of the second something so we need to have that that temporal presence uh, we also need to argue or show that two variables that are related to one another uh, because i'm arguing this leads to that or this causes that uh, if they are related they have to covary they have to change together in some form shape or fashion otherwise they cannot be related to one another and finally this is the, the tricker part i need to be able to show or argue that my research model that i'm proposing for this survey is capturing everything relevant that should be in the model itself and that i'm not missing any major impacts or effects that that should be there so for example in this in this picture that there's not another variable here that has impacts on this and maybe also has impacts on on this uh, if that happens and i miss it then what i see as the relationship between this and this maybe in fact something else that is happening behind the scenes that because i'm missing it i, I cannot put in my in my model so internal variety is somewhat different in a survey than an experiment. Another major concern that we have in surveys has to do with, with common method, common method bias. Uh, the idea here is that the way in which you build a survey and the way in which you ask questions and so on uh, leads us as, as the respondents to the survey to answer it in a way that inflates the actual relationship they are trying to study that because of the way you ask the questions, the way you present them in the survey, the order in which you show them and so on, that leads us to answer them in a way that inflates those, those relationships that we're interested in. Because when I'm doing research, I'm trying to understand the relationship between A and B and C. I don't really care for, for how you answer the questions. And in how you answer the questions um, influences that relationship, then I have, then I have a problem. Uh, as an example of a survey, uh, what is likely the most cited paper in our, in our discipline, the Technology Acceptance Model by, by Fred Davis. Uh, the research model looks something like this. We have uh, perceived usefulness here. We have perceived use of use here. Uh, we have attitude, intention, and then actual use or, or, or behavior. This is the original time model from 1989. Of course, it looks very different uh, today. If I wanted to test this model using a survey, I would need a set of questions to measure this. I would need a set of questions to measure this, another set of questions to measure attitude, another set of questions to measure intention, and another set of questions to measure actual use. Uh, as an internal validity question, for example, I would have to ask or argue that uh, there's no other way but what I'm showing you in this picture that say um, usefulness and attitude are related to one another. That is, there's no hidden variable here, whatever that is, that has both an impact on attitude and also an impact on usefulness that may be responsible for what we think is this arrow over here. Uh, the common method bias question uh, and this is something that if you're a survey researcher, you have to pay quite a bit of attention to. The common method bias question here is, is there something about the way you built that survey? Something about the way in which you ask the questions, the scales you use, the, the response values? Is there something there that maybe led people to answer questions in a certain way? That what you are seeing when you collect the data and, and do the analysis is not really these relationships that you're interested in here and here and here and so on but what you're seeing is really an effect of how the questions were asked uh, or, or how much of what you're seeing may be a consequence of how the questions were asked uh, and that is always going to be a concern and there's quite a bit of research some of which i've done myself on common method bias and how to detect whether you have a problem or how to measure how much of a problem you may have and also in things you can do to prevent it from, from happening. But if you're a survey researcher, this is something that you really need to look into. Uh, because if you do not pay attention to this when you build your survey, then again, there's nothing we can do afterwards. And, and if you have no way of showing me 
that you do not have a common method bias problem, then as a reader, I do not know what to make of the results you're presenting me. Uh, third, but much less common, uh, research design IS is a meta-analysis. Uh, but although we've seen a, a, a few a few interesting ones as, as of late, so we may be catching up a bit. Uh, the idea here is, is as follows. Um, after maybe years of doing research on, on some research streams or on some specific relationships, we have dozens, in some cases, hundreds of studies that have examined some different facet or aspect of the same research problem. With the meta-analysis, what we can do is put together that population of studies that have already examined something and bring them together to, to understand you know, everything we know about a given research question or problem. Uh, now, some studies have a larger sample, some studies have a smaller sample, some studies have one measure, some studies use a different measure. Some studies were really well done, some studies maybe not so much. So we need to account for all those differences. Uh, the interesting differences are maybe some studies were done with accountants, and our studies were done with marketing people. Some studies were done with mobile banking, while our studies were done with video games. And so maybe the population makes a difference. Maybe the technology itself makes a difference. Being able to bring together all those studies uh, in, one, in one setting allows you to have a better sense of what is actually going on and how much of an impact do technology types or population types and so on have on the results. Now, if you're doing a meta-analysis, the major concern as a researcher that you have is whether you have collected or, or got your hands on every study that has examined the research that you're interested in. Part of the challenge here is that we know we have a bias for publishing research that has actually found something or research that has significant results, which means studies which have been done uh, and maybe well done, but which did not find the results we're looking for tend not to be published. And that is the, the so-called file drawer problem. There are drawers in our desks, our offices, which have studies that didn't work out. And by not publishing them or, or them not ever making it through the review process, there's a whole portion of that universe of studies that has examined a problem that I'm interested in that never seen the light of day. So if you are a meta-analytic researcher, one concern you have is trying to find out as many as possible of those studies that never made it into journals or, or conferences. An example of a meta-analysis research uh, from uh, Jennifer Gerros, I think is, is her dissertation, uh, is um, looking toward the future of IT business strategic alignment through the past, a meta-analysis. What she's looking at here is uh, strategic alignment research, IT business alignment research. And we have quite a few studies that have looked at that. Her goal was to bring them together to see if we can better understand that relationship between uh, strategic alignment and performance. Uh, just to show you the, the kind of work that you have to do to do a meta-analysis, uh, we, we have to collect and find all those studies, studying that, that relationship we're interested in. We have to code them. For example, some studies use different dimensions of alignment than others, and that needs to be coded. Uh, for example, some studies use different performance types than others, and that needs to be coded as well. Uh, we do this with multiple people so that my coding does not, uh, doesn't become the only one that goes into the research. Uh, that means we need to concentrate whether the way I am coding something and the way my colleagues are coding it uh, is consistent. And then we do all the actual work of, of the meta-analysis itself. Um, so maybe some of the effects that we're seeing in this um, strategic alignment and performance relationship have to do with the different dimensions of alignment that were used or maybe they have to do with the different types of performance measures that were used. So maybe if you look at financial performance, uh, you get a different view of this than if you look at, for instance, um, customer performance. So maybe the performance measure matters, maybe the type of dimension matters. And we also need to know, you know how many people participated. Not all results have the same sample size and that needs to be, to be taken into account. So these are what I think are the three most common 
um, research design IS, I, I accept surveys and me backtrack. The three most common qualitative results in IS. Uh, surveys are most likely the first one. Uh, uh, experiments, the second, and meta analysis are a distant third. But I think, as, as we've seen with many other disciplines, as we get older, more mature, and we start building these bodies of knowledge on, 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 on major research streams, uh, at some point we start having sufficient research that has already been done on a particular problem or relationship or area that it is worth going back, you know, getting our arms around everything that we know about, say, business IT alignment and figuring out what it is that we know, what it is that we do not know, and what are interesting directions for, for future research. So as we get older as a discipline, as a discipline, uh, I think we're going to start seeing more, <coughs> excuse me, uh, more of these type of meta-analysis reviews that we have so far. So for the last portion of, of the presentation, uh, let me switch over, uh, again, without any math, but let me switch over to, to some of the statistical thinking that we use as quantitative researchers in order to make sense of our results and also in order to present them to, to readers as we seek to write uh, our, our, our research for us to see. There's an acronym here, SPINE, uh, for what I think of as the five key elements that you should always be looking for in statistical results and that you should be always report on your on, on quantitative research papers uh, so as to present you know, evidence supporting the, the relationships you're interested in. So I go through all five of them in a different order because the acronym works better this way. Uh, but we have parameters, we have estimates, we have standard errors for those, we have confidence intervals, and we have this null hypothesis testing. So I'll walk you through, through each one in turn with, with some examples. Again, no math. If you're interested in the math, I'd be happy to talk to you. I'm more than happy. Uh, but I wanted to keep this at a, at a conceptual level. So if you're doing quantitative research, it's because you would like to know something about some parameters that you're interested in. Parameters are quantities, relationships at a population level that you would like to know about, but which you cannot directly observe. So for example, since we're all in some kind of, of election season, I would like to know what is the proportion of voters that are going to vote for a certain candidate <clears throat> in an upcoming election. Or I may like to know what is the relationship between attitude towards smoking and intention to smoke in adolescents, because that's an interesting public policy issue. Or I may like to know how much better I can train people using one approach than using another, or whatever it is that you're studying. So every statistical test that we run in our quantitative research studies is going to refer to one parameter that you would like to know about as a researcher, but which you cannot directly observe. I really would like to know what is the proportion of voters who will vote for X in the upcoming election. But unless I go out and ask every single person who is able to vote, uh, that the value of that parameter is not something that I, that I can directly observe. They are, however, these parameters, they are the object of my research. This is why I do research, because I would like to know answers to these questions. I would like to know what is the relationship between attitude towards smoking and intention to smoke in adolescents. Because if I want to prevent them or discourage them from smoking, um, maybe one way I can do that is by changing their attitudes towards smoking. But for that to work, I need to know that their attitude towards smoking has an impact on their smoking behavior. If that is not the case, then changing their attitudes is not going to make any difference. So these parameters are what you're interested in knowing about. This is why you do research, but which you cannot directly observe. Now, what you can do is to get your hands on a sample of people from the population that you're interested in. You can collect data from that sample, whether you're doing this through a survey or an experiment, and use that data to calculate an estimate for that parameter. Ideally, this would be a random sample or random enough, and there are good reasons for that. So the second thing, the second uh, key element on any statistical testing is an estimate. I do not know what is the proportion of Florida voters who will vote for X in the upcoming election, but I can ask maybe a few hundred of them what they're planning on voting for in the next election and use their answers for me to calculate an estimate 
of what that proportion is. Is it going to be an accurate estimate? Of course not. Uh, is it going to be reasonably good if I do my research right? Then yes. So if I wanted to know the true value of that parameter, I would need to ask every single voter. I cannot do that. I do not want to do that. What I can do is get a sample of them, a big enough, ideally random sample, ask them some questions about who they're going to vote for, or maybe asking them how tall they are, or maybe asking them what they think of smoking and how likely they are to smoke in the future, and so on, and, and get an estimate for, for those parameters that I'm interested in. Uh, most common estimator are least squares. Uh, if you've done any statistics work, you will recognize this. Uh, but there's others that we can use as well. The key idea is there's a parameter or more that I'm interested in. I would like to know what those values are. Uh, what I can do is get a sample from the population of interest and use that data to give me an estimate for that parameter. So the first thing we're going to report when we write our, our quantitative studies is my estimate for, say, the relationship between perceived usefulness and intention to adopt a new technology is this much. That's my best estimate for what that relationship is based on the data that I collected. And again, based on the quality of the measures that I use. Quality of measurement underlies everything we do in quantitative research. Now, just telling you a point value, a number for, for a parameter, uh, for an estimate, doesn't really tell you much but that doesn't really tell you the whole story of what's going on with that, with that estimate. Uh, let's say, again, because we're all in election season, let's say that I tell you, you know, the intention to vote for candidate X is 45%. Now, that's, that's useful, but I would naturally ask, you know, what is your margin of error? Because it is one thing for you to tell me the intention to vote for candidate X is 45% plus minus 1%. That tells me most people, most likely somewhere between 44% and 46%. That's, that's actually interesting information. It's very different for me to tell you the relationship is for, uh, the intention to vote is 45% plus minus 5%. Well, that tells me it's anywhere from 40 to 50%. That's not really as interesting as it was before because that's a very wide range. Anything can happen there. So I need to know uh, what is that margin of error? What is that variability in that estimate that, that I'm telling you? Same thing if I'm telling you the relationship between usefulness and in, um, intention to adopt the technology is X, how sure are you? How precise is, is that estimate? So the standard error of an estimate is a measure of the accuracy of that estimate. Now, how much error you know, is there in, in that estimate? If you think about it, and I'll show you an example in the next slide. If you think about it, if I go out, and ask a bunch of questions of a group of people, I will get an estimate. And then if I go out and do it again with a different group of people, because they are different people, I will get a somewhat different estimate. And if I do it again, I will get another estimate. And if I do it again, I will get another estimate. Each time, I'm asking a different group of people. Uh, this is no sampling variation. If you were to do your studies over and over and over and over again, you will get a range of values for those estimates that will be different somewhat because you're asking different people each time. That's perfectly natural, that's perfectly fine. Uh, standard errors allow us to calculate that variability without having to uh, do the research over and over and over again because I really don't want to do that. So uh, the standard error is a measure of how much variability is there in a statistical estimate that you calculated from the data you collected. So if I were to you know, survey this population of people multiple times, each time I ask them, a different group of people, a set of questions, I would get a somewhat different result. If I were to do this over and over again, which of course I don't want to, but if I were to do this over and over again, I would get a, a distribution of, of those results. That is a measure of how much variability is there in the results that I'm getting. So standard errors, the, the variability, the accuracy of the statistical estimates that you calculate from your research are a function of two things. There's the natural variability in whatever you're studying or measuring, and there's really nothing you can do about it. And there is the amount of data that you got your hands on to do your research that you have control over. So as a quantitative researcher, one of the key things you're going to do when you're planning your research 
is figure out how much data do I need to collect in order to have the level of accuracy that I'm interested in, uh, based on what I know about the research stream, based on what I know about what other people have done in the past, based on how certain I want to be about the estimates that I'm providing people. And again, if we go back to, to political polling, if I wanted to have a plus minus 1% as my margin of error, I need a lot more people than if I want to have a plus minus 5% in my margin of error. Uh, so you need to decide how accurate you want to be, and that will tell you, you know, how many people you need in your, in your sample. So sample size is going to be another key thing for that planning stage of your research that we need to be mindful of. Something else that you always want to report, I think you should always want to report you know, when we do quantitative research, although I'll be the first to agree that that's not always the case. Uh, I would like to see a, a confidence interval. I would like to see a, a range uh, of values, not just one point estimate, not just tell me, you know, the relationship between perceived usefulness and intention is 0.4. Uh, tell me a range of values. So maybe it goes from 0.35 all the way to 0.45. Uh, give me a range so I can see how much variability is there in the results that, that you're giving me. So think of confidence intervals as the estimate that you obtain from the data you collected, plus minus some margin of error, um, which allows you to build the range of values around that estimate so that your readers can see this is how much variability is there in my results. You know, 0.4 is, is my best estimate for this, but it could be anywhere from here to here. Having that information is, is very useful for, for readers, I think. Uh, I'll be the first to, to admit we don't often include them, uh, but I think we're going to start seeing, in, in some disciplines, we already see that confidence intervals are mandatory when we report uh, studies, because the more information we provide, the better. Uh, people are in a position to, to understand that. Now, one issue that we run with confidence intervals, uh, just make a quick point of this. Um, when you say, uh, let's say here, oops, let me put this up. When you say the relationship between perceived usefulness and behavioral intention is, let's say, 0.4, with a confidence interval between 0.35 and 0.45, I do not really know whether the true value of that relationship is really within that confidence interval. Uh, when we do statistics, and I'll come back to this in, in the last point here uh, in a moment. When we do statistics, we're always playing uh, probabilities. We're always playing odds. We're always saying, this is the probability that I'm right, and I'm willing to take some probability that I'm wrong. Otherwise, you'll never make a decision about anything. Uh, and we never really know whether we're right or wrong. If we knew, we wouldn't be right or wrong. Uh, so when we say something like, I have a 95% confidence interval for this estimate. What I'm saying is, if I were to do the research over and over and over again, 95% of the time, that confidence interval would contain the true value of what you're trying to, to research an estimate. 5% of the time, it will not. Of course, when you do one study, your one empirical research, you do not know whether you are in the 95% of the times when that confidence interval worked, or you're in the 5% of the times when it didn't. But because 95% is much more likely than 5%, we're always going to assume that we are in the 95% of the times when it works, which means, of course, that 5% of the time you'll be wrong and you will not know it. That's, that's something that you have to be willing to accept if you do uh, statistics and quantitative research. That brings me to the last, the last uh, element of any statistical testing which is these uh, p-values that we really, really like to, to look at. Uh, to make the point here for anybody who likes to, to uh, get into some of the background, uh, for this is a really good book called uh, Daily Tasting Tea, uh, which talks about the, the origin of these ideas of, of p-values and probabilities and how we use them in, in statistics. Uh, this very stern looking guy here is a Ronald Fisher, who is one of the few handful of people who really created uh, all that we know about statistics in the 20th century. And the lady here, which is the main character in, in this book, uh, it's called uh, Muriel Bristol. And she was a PhD, at the time, she was a 
PhD student in botany, I think she studied algae and stuff like that. And she works in, in Fisher's lab. Uh, there's a third character in the story called William Roach, of whom I do not have, unfortunately, a picture. Uh, and the story goes something like this. Um, Fisher had invited, uh, because he was for the time very advanced, he had invited uh, Muriel Bristol to have tea with, with the, the male faculty. And um, he's serving tea to her. And in apparently in, you know, in England, you put milk on your tea. Why you drink tea in the first place is beyond me. I'm a coffee person. But apparently people will put milk on their tea. And so Fisher was serving uh, tea to, to Miss Bristol. And she he asked her, do you want milk on your tea? And she said, yes, but please put the tea first and the milk second. Uh, to which Fisher replied something on the lines, along the lines of, what difference does it make? Which one goes first and which one goes second? And she claimed, I can tell there's a difference in taste. If you put milk first and then you put the tea on it, than if you put the tea first and then you pour the milk on it. So Fisher and Roach decided to test whether this was actually possible uh, by means of an experiment. Uh, and a lot of these got started are thinking of, of hypotheses and p-values and, and so on. So Fisher said, I don't really believe you can tell the difference uh, whether I put the T first or the T second. Uh, that would be our null hypothesis or our baseline hypothesis. Uh, Muriel cannot tell the difference. Uh, and the alternative hypothesis, of course, is that she can. She actually can taste a cup of tea with milk and, and tell you whether the milk came first or the tea came first on the cup. Uh, the question here is, uh, how do we know whether she's actually right? How much evidence do we need before we say, well, she actually knows what she's doing or, or she actually has no idea what she's doing? I would like to point out that at least in principle, our legal systems operate like this. We start with a presumption of innocence. That's our null hypothesis. This person did not commit a crime. It is up to, to the prosecutors to show enough evidence that this person indeed committed the crime beyond a reasonable doubt principle. Uh, do we always get it right? Of course not. Uh, there's always a chance that somebody who's innocent gets convicted or somebody who should, well, should be convicted goes free. Um, but notice that when, when somebody, when we do not have enough evidence, or at least this is the, the legal uh, usage in the US, uh, when we do not have enough evidence that somebody committed a crime, we not declare them innocent, we declare them not guilty. We're not saying you didn't. I'm just saying I cannot show that you actually did. Uh, you may have done it, but I have no way of, of proving it. So going back to, to research, the idea is, you know, if, if I have a null hypothesis, in this case that Muriel cannot tell the difference, uh, and the alternative hypothesis that, that she can, how much evidence do I need for me to make that case? So I could put together a cup of tea with milk or milk with tea, and give it to Muriel to taste, and, and she can tell me which one came first. Now, in a cup of tea, it's a 50-50 chance, it's a coin flip. She could get it right just by random luck. So Fisher thought, well, we need more than one cup of tea to make sure. So the way he designed the experiment, he created uh, behind a behind screen, he created four cups where he poured the milk first and the tea second, and another four cups where he did the other way around, then he randomly rearranged them and presented them to Muriel Bristol so she could taste them and indicate which one was which. The logic here was if the null hypothesis is true, meaning she has no idea what she's doing, she cannot tell which came first, then she would only get them all right by random luck in a 1 in 70 chance. And Fisher said, I'm willing to take that, that margin of error. I'm willing, to, you know, I'm willing to say the only way she got them right is because she either knows what she's doing or this is a one in 70 chance random lack and I'm willing to live with that margin of error. Uh, and if you remember from your you know, algebra and combinatorics classes, you can run all possible combinations of four caps, first and second and so on. And there's only one way to get them right uh, out of all, all 70. Uh, so that brings uh, forward the, the decision rule that we use when we make conclusions based on statistics. Uh, we say, if I have a null hypothesis that there's nothing going on, in this case, Muriel Bristol has, has no idea about milk and tea and so on. If I have that null hypothesis as my baseline, and then I collect my data, I do my research, collect my data, measure my constructs, run them through my statistical software, and the software tells me, these are your results, and the probability 
that you will see what you're seeing, that you will find what you just found. Assuming there is nothing going on, it's really small, and we use 5% as our threshold for really small. If that probability is really small, then I will conclude as a researcher, then there is an effect, because either there is an effect, and I found the relationship between, say, perceived usefulness and intention to adopt the technology, or I just run into this really small random chance uh, that, that the data I collected come from a world where there's no effect whatsoever. And because it is a really small random chance, and because we're always playing around with probabilities, uh, I'm going to conclude that anything that happens less than 5% by random chance isn't really happening. That's how we make statistical decisions, which means you're always running a 5% risk of being wrong. And you have to be comfortable with that idea uh, if you're a quantitative researcher. Now, if you extrapolate this a bit more, if every statistical test that we run has a 5% chance of being wrong, that means there's about a 5% chance that any given research study in any given journal is wrong. Uh, and again, we have to be willing to live with that, that possibility. Uh, to, to wrap up the story, uh, Muriel Bristol was presented with her eight cups, four one way, four the other way. She got every single one of them right. So she clearly know, knew what she was doing. And to show you that statistics can be romantic as well, uh, Muriel married William Roach and lived happily ever after for, for many, many years. Uh, to give you a, a set of rules, uh, I'll, I'll close with this. Um, this is how we do statistical testing. If you're a quantitative researcher, statistics are a part of, of how you do research. Uh, this is how, these are the steps that we follow for, for doing research. We, we generate hypotheses. We, let me make this up. Uh, we generate hypotheses. We specify the error rate that we're willing to live with, and that's usually 5%. Uh, we, we choose which statistics are we going to use. And we calculate how many people we need, or what sample size we need. And this is going to be one critical thing that you have to do as a quantitative researcher. Then I'm going to get my sample and compute my statistics. And then I'm going to compare the p-value that I found with that level of error that I was willing to live with. And I'm going to make a decision one way or the other, depending on, on what those results are. But the key thing to remember here is you're always playing with probabilities. There's always a possibility that, that you're wrong and you have to feel comfortable uh, doing that. Anytime you make decisions under uncertainty, there's always a chance that, that you're wrong. Um, but if you don't, you're not willing to take that chance to be wrong, then you're never going to be right about anything either. So that's how, how our point in methods work. So key takeaways, I think, from, from today. Um, I'm a very strong believer. I think we should think about it this way. Quantitative research is about building models. Quantitative research is about finding one or more outcomes that you're interested in. Those could be attitudes, could be perceptions, could be intentions, whatever it is that you're studying. There's going to be one or more outcomes that you're interested in. We want to build models that explain those outcomes of interest. Why do those outcomes take on different values for different people? by means of a set of reasons or factors or drivers or independent variables uh, that, that tell me you know, the reason why some people are happier than others is because some people make more money than us. We can test that empirically. When you, collect, when you start collecting data, everything you have done so far becomes set in stone. Once you start collecting data, there's no chance for you to go back and add more questions. There's no chance to go back and measure something that you didn't think about. There's no chance for you to go back and change the wording. There's no chance to go back and do anything. Um, everything, every decision you have made up to that point becomes set in stone. That's why I think we should spend quite a bit of time planning and thinking and designing before we go out and collect data. Because if there's a flaw in your design, there's nothing you can do to fix it afterwards, uh, short of redoing your research. I truly believe high quality measurement is central to, to any kind of quantitative research study. If you cannot convince me as a reader or editor, I'm also a senior editor for a journal, so it's a, a, a good that in. Uh, if you cannot convince me that you have successfully measured with good quality the constructs in your research models, then I cannot really believe or trust anything that comes after that. You may be perfectly right, but I need the evidence that that was done that way. Uh, I think there are three common, and there's more, of course, but three major types of, of uh, 
quantitative research design the discipline. Uh, each one of them has its own issues uh, for you to think about. So if you're going to be doing a survey, uh, in addition to all this measurement, uh, if you're doing a survey, you want to think about common method bias and how to protect yourself from it. If you're going to be doing experiments, you want to think about internal validity and manipulation checks. Otherwise, I don't know what you found. If you're going to be doing a meta-analysis, the key thing is uh, the amount of coverage or the extent of coverage that you have. Uh, finally, I talked about this, this acronym, the, the spine of, of statistics. Statistics are a key part of being a quantitative researcher. We cannot do quantitative research without statistics. Uh, I think that for every statistical test that you run, there's five things that you always want to talk about when you're presenting your results. Uh, roughly in this order, you want to tell me what parameters you're interested in. You want to tell me about the estimates that you calculated from your data. You want to tell me about the accuracy of those estimates. You want to give me a reasonable range for the values of those estimates. And then you want to tell me something about how likely is it that what you found is by just pure random chance. And, and if you can do that, I, I, I believe, uh, if you can do all four or five of them, I believe uh, what you're telling me. So I want to stop here. Uh, I think we've done quite a bit. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I'll be happy to go into more detail about anything that I that I talked about, and I'll be happy to connect with anybody afterwards as well. Okay, thank you very much, Miguel, for this uh, enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, you know, you, you you talked a lot about preparation, and uh, while we were talking about preparation of uh, you know your research, your your quantitative research, I was thinking here. I was a, a lecturer before I became a researcher in in. In information systems, or in, in fact, in any in, in any in any field, uh, and I remember at the beginning, I always thought as a, a lecturer, I always thought, okay, I had to assess the quality of uh, the, the quality of my students' learning, and I could do it both ways. I could have at the end of uh, some time, I could just have a, a very quantitative test, or a qualitative way of uh, doing it. You know, I could do it both ways. When I chose the quantitative uh, kind of uh, assessment, it it was always a lot of preparation work. Because, as you said, when, we, when we, we prepare something and we prepare it poorly, it's difficult afterwards to, call, to, 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 good, to do good analysis because the data that you will receive back is poor also. Yeah. Um, so so uh, I always had this feeling that, uh, you know, preparing a, an exam, a quantitative exam, was a lot of work to prepare. Yeah. And the analysis afterwards was much easier compared to doing the opposite, giving the students a blank page and saying, convince me that you learned something here, uh, which was no work at first, but very qualitative and then work, work afterwards, very difficult afterwards. Right. And I do think that there is this uh, uh, with research that also happens if you if you don't plan well your quantitative research, it's going to be poor for sure. If you don't plan your qualitative, well, I'm not saying that you shouldn't uh, do, uh, that, that you should do any qualitative research without planning. Mm -hmm. But qualitative, it seems that there is still a way you can rescue your research in the middle of the way because you can uh, you, you you can change it and uh, uh, and, and so, so I, I don't know if you have that that sort of if you think that we can uh, you know do, do that sort of analysis <laughs> do, do, do you think that it makes sense? No, it, it does, and, and the, the reason why I, I spend so much time on it, and I, I, we do the same with our, with our doctoral students. Um, there's for for any any study that you want to do for any research design. There's a few key things that if you don't pay attention to them before, there's nothing you can do about it afterwards. Uh, I think that my best example is, is those manipulation checks and experiments. If you do an experiment without manipulation checks, there's really nothing you can do about it afterwards. And, and now I have to take it on faith, whereas I would like to see evidence rather than take it on faith. Uh, I absolutely agree when, when my, um, my undergrad uh, back home in, in Buenos Aires, the uh, vast majority of my exams were Here's a piece of paper, write for an hour and tell me something you learned. Um, those are much harder to really understand and make sense of, of the arts. But I agree. Right. Yeah, it's a, so, so uh, again, uh, it's, it's, it's not a rule of thumb, but yeah, if, you, if you're going quantitative, you have to be very strict from planning. And maybe this is why uh, Miguel spent so long talking about the preparation. I don't know. Uh, whoever has a question, just jump in, open your mic. Raise your hands uh, uh, if you wish. I have, I have one more uh, thing that I uh, myself would like to ask. You, Miguel, is uh, I, I, I always think that regardless if we're talking about an experiment, a survey, or some meta-analysis, we always end up, even if we try not to, we always end up with convenience samples, right? Yes. Uh, and, and, and that, uh, 
makes me think that sometimes we get, you know, try, trying to be perfectly right, we, 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 we get perfectly wrong because, uh, because of this problem of, well, the sample not necessarily represents the, the, the population. How do you uh, deal with, with this convenience? And, and how do you, when you're writing, how do you convince your readers, uh, being them the reviewers or, or, or the readers that will read the paper afterwards, how do you convince them that your sample, although being a convenient sample, is a good sample? Yes, no, I completely agree. I, 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 I no, the, the idea also, so we, we, we want to, we want to get as close as the ideal perfect study as we can, knowing that it will never be a perfect, no study is, is going to be perfect. Uh, there are some things that are under control, such as the questions we ask, how we ask them, how we design experiments, and so on. But the, the issue of getting the sample is, is I think, one of the uh, less, less, discussed partly because you're i think you're absolutely right it is you know we operate large and convenient samples mm -hmm. now i think part of the way we you know first of all we all know that's the way that's that's um, you know doing true random sampling in, in, in say information system research or marketing research or it's it's almost almost not done uh, now if you're doing if you're a political consultant and you're doing political polling i don't know that you do put a random sampling but let's say that's that's how you should do it um, so I, I think part of, because we're all aware of the issue, I think we, we pay a bit more attention uh, to show that the characteristics of the sample we have are reasonable for, and reasonable, of course, it, it's, it's an opinion, uh, but they're reasonable for the research that we're conducting. So if I'm doing a, a study on um, managerial decision making, and what influences you know, the way people use information and make decisions in business. And then my sample is made up of uh, 40 undergraduate students, then uh, are they really managers? And, uh, and do they have the same ways of looking at the world and thinking about it as a manager does? Uh, on the other hand, if I'm doing um, a, a study on online shopping and how, say, the design of the elements in the Amazon website affects my willingness to put things on the card, then you know, everybody buys on Amazon or a lot of people buy on Amazon. Uh, now we get into are you studying young people, older people, or well, different countries and, and so on. Uh, so I think it's more about you know, knowing that convenience samples, and, and even, even, if you do, even if you do online data collection, you go to a platform like Amazon m or something like that, that's still not a random sample. It's, it's a sample of people who sign up to get the platform, which are, you know, who knows if they are like everybody else. So uh, I think part of this is, is you know, is this a sample that is based on its characteristics reasonable in terms of what I, as a reader, what I thought the sample should look like? So if you're telling me I have this research on managerial decision making and the use of information and so on, uh, what do I think that sample should look like? Well, I would expect people with a certain number of years of experience, be managers with a certain amount of education, uh, with a certain amount of income, maybe. Uh, and then if your sample looks like what I think was to be a original sample, then maybe um, this is uh, this is interesting. But I, I think you're absolutely right. It's 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 uh, one of the major challenges that, that we face. Uh, again, I, I I keep asking uh, uh, Miguel the, the things here because I you know I, I've during my career I've uh, never been completely sure if I should go quantitative or qualitative. I started very quantitative because I'm an engineer myself and sure. and we are good. We, we, we tend to feel that we are more comfortable with numbers. And more recently, I became qualitative or more qualitative for one of two reasons. I either became a little lazier, uh, well, that's, uh, or I, I remember that uh, there was this Kaplan and Norton saying all those, um, uh, the, the, how, how do the, the uh, Kaplan and Norton are the, are the guys who, who, who developed the balance scorecards in the 90s. And there was a very impactful uh, saying of them that said that accountants prefer to be precisely wrong then vaguely right. And yes. I think that this is our challenge and this is why we want to, uh, to you, you guys to, to know that we can do quantitative, we can do qualitative. Many times we even do both, right? And by the way, uh, Miguel, you said that you're, you're let's say, a root quantitative uh, uh, person, but do you ever do any qualitative uh, uh, research either to complement your work or to start from? No. Uh, not really. Uh, okay. Part of that is, and this is just you know, how, how things worked out for me over the years. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a qualitative person. I, I never had a qualitative research methods class in my entire career as a PhD student. Well, KU was only a qualitative place. Um, what happened to me was at some point in, in the, the latter part of my PhD, 
Um, and if you remember, this is when all these discussions of formative and reflective and stuff like that were starting to come up. Uh, I became very interested in research methods themselves, qualitative research methods themselves. And over the years, and this is just, you know, chance didn't happen by any kind of plan, plan design or anything. Over the years, I've done a lot of my own work on methods themselves. So if you look at my publications, there's as many, if not more, dealing with methods and statistics and so on uh, than they are dealing with information systems proper sometimes. Uh, so, so that just happened. That just it happened. was how, how, how you built your history there. Yeah, it like, worked out that way. It worked well. I got published early yeah. now, well enough. And then I said, this, um, I'm, I, I seem to be good at doing this. Why would I do something else that is very obscure to me? By, by the way, uh, uh, Miguel was mentioning normative and formative constructs and things like, uh, things like that. Uh, Stacy Peter has uh, given a, as a talk, and, and if you want to check that, I think it was either last year or the year before, specifically on that, this is a, a, a very good way of, uh, you know, working on quantitative on, uh, methods to make sure that you also address uh, issues that, uh, that, 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 that that would interest qualitative researchers as well. Well, guys, uh, questions there? I, uh, I noticed that there are some of our Lacaisa uh, people that are always around there, and uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to, to to be the only one to ask questions here. Please, if you have any questions, otherwise I, I still have a couple of things that I would like to know from from Miguel. But feel free. Anyone? I thought that Jose Robles would have a question for us, but he's quiet there. You know, like. <laughs> or. All right. Uh, one more, more uh, last uh, thing that I would like to know from you, uh, Miguel. What is? Uh, I mean, you 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 were you're saying that, for, for example, you uh, one should concern about uh, the common method bias mm -hmm. uh, when doing uh, uh, surveys, uh, and and of course, uh, uh, well, we've already talked a little bit about uh, convenience, uh, the, 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 the the convenience samples, and, and and I think that they address the, the that's basically uh, addressing the, the the same issue. But from those three types of. Uh, um, of uh, uh, quantitative uh, research uh, proposals that you 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 gave us uh, experiments surveys or meta analysis which one do you think uh, someone who's writing their first academic paper should uh, try w what is the easiest one to start with i don't know so let me the, the, the meta analysis i'm very interested in meta analysis myself and done some some research on it uh, that is uh, that is a whole other process in terms of the time that we're talking a lot, about. A lot of people have been doing some of some of these bibliometric studies these days and, and uh, even uh, how they call uh, 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 systematic literature reviews. Do, do they all qualify for U.S. meta-analysis uh, studies? Uh, not quite because in what I think of as a, as a meta-analysis or the, the more formal you know, type of definition of analysis, you are collecting a body of knowledge, right? A, a list of studies that have studied something you're interested in. And then you're extracting from that some key statistical results. And then you model the results themselves in a, in a second analysis. Okay. So for instance, if you have every correlation between perceived usefulness and intention to use the technology from all these probably thousands of studies on, on this, then you can model those correlations become the data for your right. analysis. So, uh, but in a, in a systematic literature review, you, you also think that uh, well, the literature becomes the corpus of your analysis. But I don't think that they usually get to be that statistical. No, there. no that's, right. that's I think the main difference. Yeah, may, maybe only may, maybe only doing some uh, more simple statistics of counting, organizing tables, and things like that. Yeah, yeah I see. So that would probably. I, I would say that the meta analysis we're talking about a whole other, you know, the, the amount of work involved in in the world of meta analysis just because of. The, the amount of studies that have to be located and read and coded and everything, that's a, that's a whole different that's a whole different process. Uh, both surveys and experiments, I think, have have their advantages and, and disadvantages in terms of, of where where would I start for my first paper. Uh, I think experiments are conceptually simpler to think about, uh, but surveys are probably faster to put on the field. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to go out and collect data faster. Unless I'm using, let me backtrack. If you have to develop new measures for something, now we're talking about a whole different process. Mm -hmm. But if the research study you want to you want to do can be done with existing measures and so on, you can probably put together a survey in, in much less time. Assuming your theory is good and your research model is sound and the whole thing, uh, you can put that in much less time than you could do a well-designed experiment. Uh, that would probably be my initial reaction. Right. When you were talking about surveys. Uh... 
anytime that I thought you were you were going to mention variables with respect to a construct, you were talking about questions already. So yeah. does that does that mean because you're thinking of a questionnaire, right, to collect that data, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. Uh, and and is there any uh, and, and and now this may be a, a very stupid uh, question uh, from my end here, but can you have surveys without a questionnaire? I mean, surveys in which you collect data in, in some other fashion. I think you could if you had. Well, not by direct. Well, let, let me backtrack. I've seen some. So there's two things I'm thinking of. I've seen some some interesting attempts to measure things without asking questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, now that we have this thing called computers and so on, where people can. So, for instance, you know, instead of asking you, you know, a scale of one to seven, this, this, and this, you know, point to the area where you think more that represents. So, without asking questions for me. Also, of course, we have uh, when we think of surveys. We think of a person answering a set of questions. That doesn't mean we cannot have uh, somebody else asking questions, but not necessarily in a survey type of format. It will still be a quantitative study. One of our DBA students last year, uh, where is Alicia from? She's from Nicaragua. Uh, she, is, she lives in San Francisco, and San Francisco, for anybody who's been there, has a sizable population of homeless people. And she was doing uh, research on, on the, the you know, issues dealing with homeless, homelessness. And so her data collection, which was a survey, was essentially going out with the, the clipboard and stopping them on the street and asking them, you know, how you feel about this, or what, what are important things to you in this and this and this. So it was a survey, it was quantitative, but it wasn't quite a questionnaire, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, but those are maybe more more specific type of, of cases. Well, perfect. I, well, I, I see that the guys today are, I told you that some days they're a little shyer, and I, I think that quantitative always scares people a little bit at the beginning. Yeah, but I, I, I try to stay away from math at all. Yeah, you, you're very good at that. It's that's the way it's always. Uh, you were very good with, with that, and I think, uh, uh, yeah, people have to start, uh, you know, one step at a, at a time, but again, uh, quantitative, quantitative, quantitative methods are a very important kind of uh, uh, tool uh, in, in, our, in, in our information systems field. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think that, that uh, whoever is taking a master's or, or uh, a doctoral uh, 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 course uh, or pro uh, that is in, in a program right now that should uh, uh, be away from uh, quantitative methods simply because they, things seem uh, uh, hard at the beginning. Uh, you definitely, uh, that, that has to be a tool that everyone needs to dominate at least not to be cheated by those who use sometimes quantitative studies mm -hmm. in a very poor way to emphasize uh, their their arguments, they, they don't know what they're doing, but they 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 sort of legitimize their 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 work because uh, of they're doing it with numbers. So we have to, to be uh, careful. Yeah, about I, that. I would say yes. I, I would say well done research is always interesting and worth reading and poorly done research of any kind mm -hmm. should, yeah. should find its way into our into our our journals and conferences. And Definitely, uh, I, I noticed that someone was writing something here on. Uh, no, but it's gone for whatever. I don't know. Well, anyway, Miguel, thank you very much for that. I just want to uh, very quickly tell people what we'll be doing next. And, and this is why I'm showing this screen of mine here. Next week, we will not have uh, the seminars. Uh, 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 I will be working on a, on, on a review panel for a Saudi, Saudi Arabian uh, program. And I will be so connected. But by the way, there is a conflict of timing there. And I won't be, be able to hear. So I prefer to give you a little more time. To think and to think about your papers. Remember, we're at a time that we have to start thinking about the objective of what we're going to to write about. So the topic, define an objective, and think of an, a methodology. Maybe Miguel has inspired us, uh, some of you here, to go more quantitative. But anyway, you have to think of a problem and a way to solve it. Uh, the the there's a link here for those who has who have not yet uh, sent me that kind of information. You have uh, some 10, 15 days to to do that now. We will be back. Uh, on the, 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 the 31st, uh, in which we will uh, then discuss something that may be, uh, 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 Miguel was not, uh, well, he didn't have time to, to talk about that, but is if you're going to do surveys or if you're going to, and, and many in the case of surveys, you have to convince people to answer your questionnaires, right? Uh, uh, and my idea with our next seminar is to show you at least some of my experience uh, with getting people to, to answer questionnaires. But one hint, uh, Miguel has already given a lot of good preparation, a lot of preparation of your, your material, because when uh, someone is answering a questionnaire and, 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 and the person who's answering the questionnaire starts realizing that there are flaws, that the data that is being generated, that is being collected will not uh, help the researcher 
uh, gets to any good conclusion when, when the when when the you know that person who's contributing with the research feels that that's garbage that is going in and therefore garbage will come out of that research later there's a great chance that they will stop in the middle they will not finish uh, 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 answering even if they, they they are people that respect you as a uh, that, that respect the fact that you're trying to do research they will say no this is no no good result that will, will come out of this so the first thing is focus on on, on the quality but there is uh, some other tricky things that we can do is to get a connection with those that will answer uh, for us uh, and sometimes that even involves trying to be more personal in the way you address them and uh, so we'll, we'll be talking about some strategies to get more uh, responses to uh, to surveys or to, uh, to to surveys or, or to, to invitations uh, to participate either in a in, in maybe in a in an experiment or to participate in a more qualitative uh, tool that you're using with interviews or whatever so that's going to be our next topic Miguel again thank you very much this was great uh, contribution to us uh, well, Patricia has her hands up if you want just open your uh, your mic uh, there Patricia and just ask whatever é, eu só queria uh, agradecer ao professor Fuel que havia colocado ali no chat ah, agradecendo é... a fala do, do professor Miguel até porque a parte da pesquisa qualitativa eu tenho bastante dificuldade assim então esclareceu bastante para mim assim a pesquisa então, mais qual, é a qualitativa eu tenho mais uh, apropriação e a quantitativa eu tenho uma dificuldade maior então esclareceu bastante eu gostaria de agradecer Okay, well, perfect. I don't know if Miguel knows enough I, Portuguese. I, I know I, I, enough that I know what, what yes. I cannot speak, but I, I get enough. Of it, yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, anyway, what, what, what my, my deal with them is that they, they, here they can always ask things in Portuguese, Spanish, whatever language, uh, and many times they do that. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, guys, for being here, and uh, I see you in, in a couple of weeks. So, next week, you have a forced holiday, right? You have one, well, not forced holiday, you work on defining your, your objective and thinking of a methods to uh solve the problem that you're you've decided on and and uh, i'll see you in in two weeks from now see you guys thank you again miguel bye okay bye okay, bye miguel good to see you ah okay. now he's there see i think he was having lunch or something and no I, yeah i couldn't i couldn't get out of a meeting early enough but uh yeah i was following All thank right. you miguel. thank Great you very part. much Jose, for being there uh, uh with us here it's always uh, good to have these guys that this time he didn't ask ask question but many times he's, he's one of the guys who's here to make sure that we do not get out of here without extracting all the, you know, uh, all the knowledge we can from, from, from our speakers. Yeah, Thank you again. I, bye, guys. I, I, yeah, bye, bye. Bye. bye.